Hello my loves, welcome back to another video. I'm Ashley and today we're going to be going through my February wrap up. In February I read a total of seven books, all of them were fantasy, two of them were manga and we are just going to jump right in. So I'm going to start off with the manga because this is volumes two and three from The Girl From The Other Side. This is a really charming manga series that is set in a world that is split in two. One side containing just your standard human and the other side containing these creatures, monster-like figures who have been plagued by a disease of sorts. And it's said that if anybody is touched by one of these creatures they also gain this disease and become one of them. And they're all just sent to the other side to go and live there. It's said that anybody who goes over there can't come back. But in the very first one, we followed this little tiny girl who was just seen strolling around on the other side. She's clearly been abandoned there. And the creature who takes her in and just looks after her. From volume one, I absolutely fell in love and I've been desperate to read volumes of two and three. So I managed to do that. This is a bind up of the first three. So with these ones specifically for volume two, I rated that one three stars because that one definitely felt much more like a filler volume. It really read as if we just needed to get from point A to B within this series and it was almost as if the author needed this one little thing to happen that was pretty much the only thing that happened within that volume but didn't quite know where to fit it within the first or the third volume so this second one was created to just kind of fill the gap. And I won't say that I necessarily minded it because this is the sort of story that is just so wholesome and sweet to read that I don't think I could ever dislike just reading about them going about life. <laughs> and there was also a very interesting introduction to another kind of branch of creatures in this one. And of course the artwork is stunning. That wasn't going to change. All of my praises from the first volume apply to this one too. I don't think I would have missed out on anything in particular had we removed the second volume. So I did just rate that one three stars but then volume three went up to a four star again because in that one we have our first separation of the little girl and the monster and it was honestly just so heartbreaking to read but in a very clever way in which your own emotions as a reader were being tugged on in so many different directions because the thing that happens is supposedly a good thing and so you're kind of warring with yourself between what should happen versus what you want to happen and as well as that all the way through you can sense this foreboding, this idea that something is wrong in the background but we are largely following the perspective of the little girl and so she's just not seeing this and that's why it's so heartbreaking because you just want everything to be okay for her and you see all of the danger and honestly it's just like being a parent yourself when you're reading it. <laughs> I also didn't expect the ending of this one and I was really pleasantly surprised because I'm not quite sure where I expected this story to go but it definitely wasn't the turn I was seeing coming and so I am now even more intrigued to continue on with the second bind up of this so volumes four five and six because I just need to know where we're going now. I I'm so intrigued. So yes, I rated that one four stars and still would consider this one of my favourite manga series. It's so good, highly recommend it. I finally got around to finishing The Last Tale of the Flower Bride in February. I started this one in January and for some reason was just taking my sweet time with it, but this was quite a slow moving one. So this one is kind of a Bluebeard inspired story in which we are following a man who is very heavily invested in folklore fairy tale mythology. He ends up marrying a wealthy heiress who is just as obsessed, if not even more. But upon marriage, they end up agreeing that he cannot look into anything to do with her childhood but that becomes a lot more difficult when they get a phone call saying that her aunt is dying and so they need to return to her childhood home where obviously all of these secrets are going to be exposed so this is a very slow moving one as I said and Rishani Chokshi in this one has a very melodic lyrical writing style that just suited the fairy tale vibe perfectly I love the emphasis on the fairy tales in this. A lot of the story is told through other stories and I just think it was the sort of stacking of stories that was so satisfying if you yourself are a fan of fairy tales and mythology because you can see all the references. You can understand why these people are so obsessed with them. And that combined with the writing style in this just worked perfectly. It felt whimsical while also feeling quite grim and dark in the background, which is the exact sort of fairy tale vibe that I love. The dark whimsy is just, Mm, love it. And Indigo, who is our main character in this book, definitely fell untouchable. From the very first time you meet her, she exudes this air of being ethereal, of being otherworldly, and that just continues all the way through. So it makes this air of mystery just so present within the story. But I did have very contradicting thoughts about the plot of this because I guessed the main plot line pretty much immediately. <laughs> and the reason why I had such conflicting thoughts about this is because if you yourself are familiar with fairy tales, then you will probably pick up on it 
pretty much immediately. And on the one hand, I do think that is very clever and something that works well for the story because it does mean that it fit into all of the themes that is a very key part of this story. But then on the other hand, when you see those themes within the original fairy tales, those stories aren't presented as a mystery, whereas this one is. So if you're reading these themes within a fairy tale, you as a reader are just observing and seeing things happening, already knowing that that is the case. Whereas in this one, it's presented slightly differently in which it is a mystery to you, but then if you already know it, it kind of defeats the purpose of the book, you know? <laughs> so I have very conflicting thoughts on the plot itself, but I can't say that it massively took away any enjoyment or anything. I would actually love to see Roshani Chokshi write more like this because I think that her writing style in this really, really suits the tone and I would just love to see her do more with fairy tales specifically. So I rated this one four stars. I highly recommend it. I really enjoyed it. And I do hope she releases something else like this because this was up there. So next up we have both Ninth House and Hellbent. So to talk about Ninth House first, this one was a reread for me. I did read it when it initially came out and I first rated it three stars and I also rated it three stars upon reread. So in Ninth House we are following Alex Stern who goes to Yale University and is part of a secret society that basically keeps other secret societies in check. This is a fantasy paranormal story as well so these secret societies are involved with magic but we also have a murder mystery because there is a girl who dies and as part of Alex's job she needs to discover if this had something to do with the secret societies or whether it was just completely irrelevant. Even though I did rate this the same the second time round I did find myself enjoying it more and I think that's because I listened to the audiobook alongside reading it. One of my main problems with this book is the way that Alex describes herself because she does this thing where she's basically posturing as being really violent and dangerous and because it's coming from her without being backed up by other characters to me it just feels really inauthentic and I do not believe her for a second it just seems like she's kind of trying to big herself up and be like yeah I'm so dangerous and I'm just like that just sounds ridiculous to me. And I was really struggling to suspend my belief when it came to how she was getting around everything because she was threatening like full grown adults who clearly had far more authority in a case than she did because she would be threatening police, she would be threatening teachers and apparently it was working because she was also dangerous and I just did not believe that for a second because if somebody tried that here, they would just be put in their place immediately. It would not fly at all. So I just could not believe that she was managing to manipulate all of these people into getting her way into gaining and access and more information on this case and that really put a hole in my enjoyment of it because that was basically how she got through everything in this book. That is how the plot progressed, that is how she interacted with people but it wasn't quite as bad in audio form. Maybe it's because I just knew to expect it this time around. I don't know but it was something I just didn't really gel with but I was intrigued about the mystery in this book. I do typically love a mystery anyway especially if it's of the supernatural nature so I was very intrigued to see how that would go down. I will say that it seemed to drag on quite a while considering she was managing to threaten a way into gaining all this information she didn't really do much with with it. But gradually seeing the puzzle pieces fit together is always a satisfying moment and something that I did keep wanting to know more about so I did keep turning the pages. This is quite a brutal and gritty kind of book. You do see the darker side towards this idea of universities and secret societies. You see how women are treated, how people of colour are treated. I will say as well I still don't understand the obsession with Darlington. I feel like Darlington's character is a character who we are told from the beginning that everybody is obsessed with and so you as a reader should also be obsessed with and again I just don't believe it I don't think we saw enough of him to actually agree with that assessment I will make that opinion for myself thank you very much <laughs> so this was kind of just like middle of the road for me again I rated it three stars but then we went on to Hellbent which is its sequel and a sequel that we've been waiting for for a long time. Now I wasn't actually sure if I wanted to continue with the series because I was quite disappointed with Ninth House the first time round but I did have very different expectations of Ninth House because people were advertising it as a dark academia book which it just isn't at all. <laughs> yes it is set in a university but that is as far as it goes. There is absolutely zero conversation about her lessons or anything to do with education really. But yeah anyway besides the point I went into this with very different expectations and I think that also might have contributed to why I maybe enjoyed it a little bit more on a second round but when it came to this one this was entirely new and I did decide to give it a go in the end and I actually ended up enjoying this one a lot more and I know so clearly that this is because the characters are built upon so much more within this book. While this book does largely still follow Alex's perspective, if not entirely, I think we might get 
a couple from Darlington's point of view. But even from Alex's point of view, we see so many characters and see her interact with so many more people that I just instantly became a lot more invested because not only did that introduction of other characters make us care more for what was happening to the people outside of Alex's own experience, but it also meant that we saw more of how Alex would react with other people, how she made friends, how she thought and cared about people, and so the stakes of the plot just felt a lot more intense because now we actually cared about people, whereas before I just didn't. I especially loved Mercy. Mercy was my favourite in this. I don't know why, she just had this kind of personality where she just wanted to be involved and would be quite soft about it as well and I just really enjoyed seeing her interactions within the story and I was really intrigued by how the plot was progressing within this one. It's very quick moving and I have seen many reviews saying this as well. It is pretty much just like event after event in this book. You don't really get too much breathing space. And I would have liked to have seen a bit more of the research and the figuring out of a problem because again it did seem as if Alex was just having a little bit too easy of a job getting people to tell her things or figuring things out and I would have liked to see a little bit more of a struggle so that it didn't seem like anybody could have done it. But it did make for a very quick read. Again, I still don't quite understand the obsession with Darlington, but that is what it is. Maybe that's just me. But I did rate this one four stars and it was largely to do with the character progression in this. So I do now know that I will continue with the series. I don't know how long it is. I've heard rumors that it's gonna be like five books long, which is way more than I thought. So I don't know, but we shall see. <laughs> Continuing on with another series, we have Blood and Honey by Shelby Muheran. This one is the second book in the Serpent and Dove series, which is a new adult fantasy romance between a witch and a witch hunter in an arranged marriage. I really, really enjoyed Serpent and Dove a lot more than I thought I would. I read that one last month, but going into this one, this one was honestly a massive disappointment because this book did not need to exist and I will stand by that. As dramatic as it sounds, this book is pure filler. Now, I don't know if Shelby Muharin has said anything about the format of the series, if there was anything beforehand about this being a duology maybe, but it definitely felt as if this was meant to be a duology, but for some reason they decided to go with the trilogy instead and Shelby Muharin then needed to create more of a second book to make that substantial enough because I couldn't even tell you what the actual plot of this book is. I'm not entirely sure what the purpose of it was. All the way through, we're just journeying and that is probably all I could tell you. We're just journeying and all of the same conversations from book one happened again within this book. They were repeated without any kind of progression of the characters, of thought, of the reason why they were saying it. They just kept coming back to the same conversations and going over the exact same topics that they've already covered and talked about with the same kind of reactions and I was just wondering at one point why are we reading this? I feel like I've just read an extended version of book one. And it is a shame because I did start out actually really enjoying this book. You can see it in one of my vlogs where I'm just like, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. And then, you know, halfway through, I realized that this is just the same as book one, but without any of the drama or tension. Because I do really love Lou as a character. She is probably one of the favorite characters of this series, if not of many series, really. She is snarky. I love how she winds up Reed. Their relationship dynamic is one that I just love reading about, but I would have loved to have seen a little bit more from it because as I said, they just kept arguing about the same thing that we've already covered. So I wanted to see them get over that. I wanted to see them progress further within this relationship and actually figure things out rather than just coming back to the same topics constantly. It was a very slow moving book. I have no idea how this book is like 600 pages long because it absolutely did not need to be. I could not tell you what those 600 pages are filled with besides just lots of conversations while they travel around. I am also very over the whole keeping secrets thing. It's the miscommunication trope to a T. It's just growing frustrating now because there is so little need for it. I don't believe the motivation behind them keeping secrets from each other. It just means that it is quite a lot of unnecessary drama and like I said it just contributes to the fact that this book did not need to exist. So I was really quite disappointed with this one. I rated it two stars. I will be continuing the series because I do have the third and final book and I'm very intrigued to see how that goes because I have heard very mixed opinions of that one when I mentioned this book in a video. Pretty much all of you agreed with my thoughts on this but you all had very mixed opinions on the third book. Some of you said that it followed the same path as this one, some of you said it was your favourite from the series so stay tuned to see which way I fall on that. I am hoping to read it in March but I will keep you updated. <laughs> And then finally, for my Patreon book club, I did read The Shadow of the Gods by John Gwynn. This is a Norse mythology inspired story that follows three people who are on a journey. And honestly, that's all I can really say because part of my criticism towards this is that I didn't really understand the point of this book specifically because this just felt like it was setting up for the rest of the series because we are following three different characters and they all do 
very obviously have a different motivation. So we have Vogue who is wanting revenge for the death of his sister and he ends up joining the Bloodsworn in the process. We have Orca whose son has been kidnapped and she's trying to find him again and get revenge on that. And then we have Elvar who is wanting to earn her own battle fame from her family. So we do have clear motivations of all of these three people but that is pretty much it. <laughs> and it sounds like that should be fine but it was just a very slow moving story considering how much action was going on, the fact that we didn't really get anywhere with any of those points. Nothing was really resolved, nothing was continued. There was a clear diversion in the story where something else came up, but it wasn't really something that I was invested enough to continue with. Now I will say as well that a lot of my opinions on this book will just be based on the fact that I typically don't get along with Norse mythology. I keep trying every so often, I will pick one up, but I just do not get along with it and it really frustrates me that I can't place why because I love mythology, folklore, everything to do with that but for some reason Norse mythology just does not catch my interest and this has been the case for years now. So do take that into consideration when it comes to my review of this book because that is a large part of where my disinterest is but I will say that the characters didn't particularly catch my attention, I didn't feel invested in their stories. It was quite hard to keep everybody separate in this book and it started to feel very repetitive both in plot and writing because we had so much fighting in this book, like so much fighting and I understand that that is a large part of this culture and society that was being built in this story but I just became sensitized to it. I didn't care what any of the outcomes of these fights were and so I just ultimately lost interest altogether. It is clear that John Gwynn knows what he's talking about. He is a Viking reenactor and so you can tell that he knows what he's talking about when it comes to the details of how to wear mail and take it off again and how to cook certain foods and all of these things but because he was repeating some of those details so much I just again stopped being appreciative of it. There were also certain phrases that just came to wind me up. My patrons will know what I'm talking about. The phrase thought cage. He calls the mind a thought cage, which is fine. Apart from he says it every like two or three pages. And it's the sort of phrase where I'm like, if you take that into just our standard context, you would not say it in your mind as often as he's saying it in this book. Because he would basically say sentences like he thought it over in his thought cage or he considered this within his thought cage and I'm like you wouldn't just say he thought that in his mind, he considered that in his mind. You don't need to specify every single time something is in your mind, clearly it is happening within your mind. But it just felt like he wanted to keep reminding you that this is like an old Norse mythology inspired thing and so I kept throwing out that phrase every so often as if we would forget and it was just really frustrating me, one because it was annoying but two because it's one of those little irks of mine where I feel like the writer didn't trust the reader to understand what they were trying to write. So yeah I just there was lots of little things about this book that I didn't get along with. Generally it was just not my vibe so I did end up writing it three stars but honestly it's more like a 2.5 very middle of the road for me. But yeah I am not going to be continuing this series and I'm probably going to unhaul all of John Gwynn's books which I am really quite sad about because I did want to enjoy him but it's just the Norse myth vibe is not my vibe. So those are all the books that I read in full. I am currently in the middle of two books. I'm still currently reading The Adventures of Amina al Sarafi and Wolf Gone Wild so I will let you know about them in my next vlog. Not the one that's going up after this because that's going to be up last weekend but the one after. I'll let you know my thoughts on those books there. I am currently really enjoying both of them though so You'll hear about them more in my March wrap up but as always I would love to know if you've read any of the books that I've just mentioned and what your thoughts on them were if you have and if you've made it this far into the video then leave a flower emoji because we're now heading into spring. But for now I'm gonna love you and leave you and let you get on with the rest of your day so I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did then remember to leave a like and a comment so you know that you're here. If you're not subscribed already then please consider doing so. Down in the description box you'll find information to all the books I've just mentioned, all my social media and other bookish stuff as well so be sure to check that out if you haven't already but for now I hope you have a lovely day and I shall see you next time with a new video. Bye!